I am Samyun Pai uh, from the National Cancer Institute, and I would like to thank the organizers at the IDF for inviting me to give this presentation. I'll be speaking to you today on understanding bone marrow transplantation and gene therapy. So this is what I plan to cover in the talk. I will discuss the basics of blood cells and hematopoietic stem cells, which we will also call HSC discuss which kinds of primary immune deficiencies or PIDs can be treated with transplant, tell you what to expect with a bone marrow transplant, and then I will also speak to you about gene therapy, covering the basics of gene therapy, what are genes, what are mutations, and then contrast gene therapy using viral vectors versus a process called gene editing. And then I will close with the differences between standard transplantation and gene therapy. So to start, uh, what does the bone marrow do? The bone marrow is the substance inside um, the long bones, um, inside the cavity, which produces all of the three main blood cell types. You can think of it as the blood cell factory. So the three main types are red blood cells that carry oxygen, white blood cells that fight infection and regulate the immune system, and platelets, which stop bleeding. Now, what are HSC or hematopoietic stem cells? These are a small population of special blood cells that live a long time and that multiply and produce all of the other blood cells. So the percentage of HSC is very small inside the bone marrow, but those are the cells that can divide. And each time they divide, they may make another stem cell or they may make a more differentiated cell that goes on to become a red blood cell, a white blood cell, or a platelet. So what is the problem with primary immune deficiency? Patients with PID have generally white blood cells or immune cells that don't work right, or sometimes they're born with certain types of white blood cells being missing. And most patients with PID were born with the disease. And increasingly, some also have a genetic cause identified. So how can a bone marrow transplant fix the problem? What we do is we can take healthy HSC from another person that will differentiate into red blood cells and into platelets, but also into healthy immune cells. In order to do this, we can't just uh, take the HSC and infuse them. We have to use chemotherapy, which are medications that are used to kill cancer cells that are rapidly dividing. And we use that to kill the patient's HSC because HSC are also dividing all the time. And then the um, subsequent cells are dividing every day to make new blood cells. So if we use chemotherapy to kill the patient HSC and then infuse uh, cells in the bloodstream uh, that are HSC from a donor um, that's suitably matched, then those cells will settle in the bone marrow and then slowly over time make healthy blood cells. So how do I know if my particular type of primary immune deficiency is treatable with transplant? There are a few things that have to be true in order for this technique to work. The PID needs to be caused by an abnormality in the blood cells. If it's caused by an abnormality in some other tissue, some other part of the body, then replacing the blood isn't really gonna help. Another thing is that because bone marrow transplant has potential complications, um, we only want to take a patient to transplant if their clinical symptoms without a transplant are severe enough or that we predict that in the future, they're gonna have major problems in order to decide to take them to a transplant. And in general, it's better if there's some type of evidence, a track record, publications, experience in the literature that shows that transplant will work for that particular disease. There are some types of PID that I would put in sort of green light category, like we're definitely going to do a transplant or there's a long track record that transplant works for the disease. Those include diseases such as severe combined immunodeficiency or SCID, wiscott aldrich syndrome, or chronic renal luminous disease. There are some diseases where there is some experience with transplantation, but there are reasons why transplant isn't always performed. So basically those are in the yellow light or it depends category. Those are things like nemodeficiency, ataxia telangiectasia, and common variable immunodeficiency. And then there are some diseases that are basically not caused by a problem in the HSC or in the blood cells. That's a red light indication, like we're not gonna do that. Um, and one of those examples is DeGeorge syndrome, 
The George syndrome is a condition where patients are born without a thymus. The thymus is the organ where T cells, a certain type of immune cells develop. Since the problem is the thymus and not the bone marrow, doing a bone marrow transplant for DeGeorge syndrome is generally not a good idea. Now, what will you expect to experience if you go through a bone marrow transplant? There are several phases. There are four phases, um, and I will go through each one and about how long each of them take. So most patients, it takes several months of pre-bone marrow transplant consultation and workup and evaluation to decide whether the person needs a transplant and determine how to do the transplant. So you start with a consultation with a transplant specialist. It's generally better to find a transplant specialist um, who is knowledgeable about PIDs. And then if the person is gonna go on to a transplant, you need to identify a donor of the stem cells, either in the family or unrelated. And then there's um, certain routine pre-transplant testing to check how well the different organs in the body are working, that the patient doesn't have infections and so on before you can go on to the transplant. The second phase is about a six to eight week inpatient stay. This is the process of going through the transplant per se. This is an admission to the hospital that usually starts with surgery to place a central intravenous line um, uh, in order that you can deliver all the medications that are needed for the transplant. Then we give seven to 10 days of chemotherapy, as I discussed, medications that are usually used to treat cancer, but here are used to clear out the HSC in the patient's bone marrow space. Then the bone marrow or other cells that contain stem cells are given on day zero. We call it day zero because it's sort of like the new birthday of your bone marrow. And then there's a period of about three to four weeks where there's no bone marrow function because the, the old bone marrow has been killed off, but the new bone marrow hasn't yet started to grow. Um, some people call it as though there's a garden full of weeds and you have to apply the weed killer and then plant the seeds, but there's a period of time where there's no plants. And after about three to four weeks, um, the first blood cells start to be being made. Um, and when the, after a couple of weeks of bone marrow recovery, the patient has enough of an immune system to leave the hospital, um, then you can be discharged. The third phase is a phase of close follow-up. The first 100 days after day zero uh, infusion of the bone marrow, um, we usually see patients at least weekly. And then after that, it's about monthly until one year after day zero. And the primary purpose of this close follow-up in the transplant clinic is to monitor for particular complications of transplant, uh, the most important one being graft-versus-host disease. Graft-versus-host disease is a condition where the immune system from the donor um, inappropriately tries to attack the patient as though it was an infection or something foreign. The other thing to note during this period, especially during the first year after the transplant is that the immune system is very low. It takes months to improve. And so temporarily, even though the reason the person is having the transplant is because of a problem with the immune system, the immune system is actually worse for a period of time. And most patients are on immunosuppressive medications. These are medications that we use to try to prevent graft versus host disease. Uh, sometimes I've told people that it's sort of like the immune system is the uh, police force or the army of the body. It's there to protect against infection. But if you go in and you replace the entire police force with a whole bunch of new policemen, police people, police officers, um, who um, you know, are dressed in similar uniforms and come from the town next door, there's still other people. So we usually start by introducing the new police force, but we don't give them any guns. And then we give them guns that have no bullets. And then we give them guns that have rubber bullets until the time point that everybody gets to know each other and everybody gets along. So that time period is the equivalent uh, of putting people on immunosuppressive medications. We force the immune system not to function until Till the new immune system and the old immune system and the, and the body are getting along. And that takes about nine to 12 months. And then finally, we usually say that any patient who's had a transplant should have long-term follow-up. Um, and this is um, really a, an annual checkup. The reason to do this is to especially monitor for 
complications or long-term side effects from having received chemotherapy. Now, I'm gonna move on to gene therapy. So how is gene therapy different from transplant? So in this little schema um, that I took from bethematch.org, which is the National Marrow Donor Program, with an allogeneic transplant, um, in other words, a transplant using cells from another person, you can get bone marrow or PBSC, which is peripheral blood stem cells, or you can use umbilical cord blood. All of those are sources of HSC. And then you do the transplant and give them to the patient. With gene therapy, you're using the patient's own cells. You can also use the same sources, bone marrow and peripheral blood stem cells are the ones that we generally use. You take the cells from the bone marrow or you give the patient medications, uh, injections that cause the stem cells to leave the bone marrow and circulate in the bloodstream. And then you use kind of like a platelet collection machine, a cell collection machine um, to collect the cells. And then you genetically modify the cells outside the body. And I will go into that a little bit more in detail in the next few slides. And then after the appropriate chemotherapy, you give the cells back. So again, gene therapy is using the patient's own cells, and then you're using some type of genetic modification to um, uh, make the cells more functional. So this gets into uh, some terminology and a little bit of education around genetics and genes. I like to think of genes um, in terms of cooking because I like cooking. So genes are a set of instructions for how to make the proteins that make cells work. And as you know, our body is made up of millions and millions of cells. So the term genome is the term we use to talk about all of the DNA in a person's cell. And it's sort of like a massive recipe book uh, for making all the proteins. And an example is Mark Bittman's How to Cook Everything. A gene is a segment of DNA that encodes a particular protein. So it's sort of like a page in the recipe book. And an example is how to make a hamburger. There's segments of DNA called promoters that directs when and where the protein is made. And that's sort of like an introduction to the recipe that says, make hamburgers specifically for a 4th of July cookout. Then amino acids are the building blocks of the protein, sort of like the ingredients in the recipe. So for a hamburger, the amino acids are the beef patty and the bun and the lettuce and the tomato. And then finally, the protein, which are molecules that perform the functions of the cell are like the food that you're making. In other words, the hamburger. So with that, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about mutations um, and why these mutations lead to problems in the body, including PID. So in the human genome, which is encoded in these uh, molecules called nucleotides, which you can think of as kind of like the letters and words um, in the recipe book, there are 3 billion nucleotides in the human genome. And those are organized into about 20,000 to 25,000 genes, in other words, recipes. And every time a cell divides, it's as though uh, a little set of typewriters has to copy um, the entire genome and type the whole genome back out again. But obviously this can't be 100% perfect. So mutation is a mistake in the DNA and it's just like a typographical error in a Word document. So substitutions, deletions of letters, additions of letters. There are many different types of mutations and some mutations are more problematic or cause disease um, or more severe disease than others. So there are mutations that people have where a segment is deleted. So if you're going back to the hamburger analogy, there could be a deletion in the DNA such that you're missing the hamburger and that's obviously a problem. There are so-called missense mutations and these kind of fall into two categories. There's some where there's partial function. So there's a typo, but instead of you know, having a hamburger with a beef patty, you could have chicken. That's not so bad, really. You know, that's pretty good as a substitute for the hamburger. Whereas if you have a different type of missense mutation where the misspelling in the DNA leads to substitution of a blueberry, that's obviously nowhere near a hamburger and doesn't really serve the same function. And then finally, there are so-called nonsense mutations where the recipe just cuts off and stops. And those are usually pretty damaging mutations that cause um, disease. 
So how do I know if my disease can be treated with gene therapy or not? There are a few different things that have to be true in order for this to happen. The first thing is that the gene must be defined. We have to know the gene that's mutated that causes the disease. We have to know something about how that gene works and know which cells need the gene in order to function. Usually diseases where we know the transplant works are the ones that we can approach with gene therapy. Um, and again, similar to going through a tr transplant, going through gene therapy has potential complications and side effects. And so we generally don't want to put people at risk of those complications unless we know that their disease is going to be bad in the future or it's bad already without treatment. Then we have to have a delivery system, some way to get the genetic material into the right cell. And there are two main ways we can use a viral vector or we can use gene editing. And I will explain those in a minute. And then finally, at the moment, there are few, you know, very few, although this is increasing, uh, gene therapies that are available as a standard medication or standard procedure. Right now, the vast majority of gene therapy is performed in the context of a clinical trial. And in order to have a clinical trial, this has to be created by scientists. So there has to be a scientific interest in developing the therapy. There needs to be some investigators, either physician investigators or scientific investigators who are interested in doing this. They have to have funding for the preclinical studies, in other words, testing the technique in cells or in animals, and then there has to be funding for the clinical trial. So how is gene therapy done? And again, I'm gonna go through the two major ways that gene therapy is done. And the first one is adding the gene to the cell using a viral vector. So vectors are the term that we use for specially designed viruses that are capable of infecting the hematopoietic stem cell and can be used to deliver the gene into the stem cell. So you can think of the vector as sort of like a delivery truck and it's carrying a normal copy of this gene X in green that is a normal copy, whereas the person in their DNA, in the spot where that recipe is, you know, has this black uh, gene uh, X, which is broken in some way. So these viruses can be used to infect the hematopoietic stem cells that we've collected from the bone marrow or from the blood of the person. Um, and then the gene uh, will insert somewhere inside the DNA of that cell. And once this happens, because the hematopoietic stem cell can divide and make all of the different types of blood cells, every blood cell that comes from that individual HSC will carry the gene. Now, a few things to note. Not every cell gets the gene. So when we take the hematopoietic stem cells and infect them with the viral vector, um, not every cell will get the gene, and some cells will get more than one copy of the gene. Um, and the other thing to know is that the gene inserts in a different place in each cell. So we're not controlling exactly where it's going to go. It's sort of like adding a page of the correct recipe somewhere in the recipe book. Now, how well does gene therapy with viral vectors work? Um, the early experience uh, was in the um, early 2000s. Some of the diseases that were successfully treated, uh, in other words, that the immune system was improved, include X-linked SCID, ADA-deficient SCID, Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome, and chronic granulomatous disease. However, these trials were all performed using a certain type of virus called gamma retroviral vectors, and these are no longer used because some patients developed cancer. Uh, and the reason that happened is that the vector, as I told you, inserts into the DNA of the cell and it, we can't control exactly where it goes. So in all these diseases with different frequencies, um, some patients got vector-induced cancer. And because we can't control where the virus inserts, and because gamma retroviruses have this tendency to land near the promoter or the control regions of genes, and because sometimes they landed next to cancer-causing genes, the viral vector turned on this cancer-causing gene and made that, that cell turn into a cancer cell. Now, fortunately, 
people have moved away from gamma retroviral vectors and they've realized that lentiviruses, um, most of them based on the HIV vector, the HIV virus, um, can be modified to remove all the HIV parts of it and just use sort of the delivery truck of the lentivirus to get the gene inside cells. And so all of these diseases, X-linked skid, ADA skid, Wiscott Aldrich syndrome, X-linked chronic granulomatous disease, Artemis skid, and leukocyte adhesion deficiency type one, um, have had or still have ongoing clinical trials using lentiviruses. These are the approximate numbers of people who have received gene therapy with lentiviruses for these diseases. They've all shown that the gene therapy can work. Um, and so far there have been zero vector induced cancers. Nevertheless, um, a second way and probably the future way that we're going to do gene therapy is a technique called gene editing, where we're trying to correct the gene itself instead of adding a copy of the gene somewhere in the recipe book. Gene editing uses special chemicals that essentially cut and paste the gene into the DNA of the cell. So instead of the previous delivery truck, we're using a different delivery truck that brings something like a scissors into um, the cell. Some of the examples of the chemicals used as scissors are zinc finger nucleases, talons, and CRISPR-Cas9. And then after the DNA is cut, then the proper copy, for example, uh, might be introduced and introduced right in the place where it's supposed to be. So it's sort of like adding a page with the correct recipe where it belongs in the recipe, in the book, or even replacing the individual steps that are wrong. Now, what are the potential side effects? This is what I'm gonna close with um, of transplant versus gene therapy. Um, which ones are the same um, and which ones are different? So I told you that for both transplant and gene therapy, you do need to use chemotherapy in some way to clear out the bone marrow and have a place for the cells, the new cells to sit. Um, it's typically true that you have to give more medication for transplants than you do for gene therapy. Um, and so the temporary and long-term effects of the chemotherapy are likely to be more with transplant than gene therapy. There's this complication that I told you about graft versus host disease, and this is caused only in transplants because you're receiving cells from another person. And it's more likely if you have mismatched or unrelated donors, whereas it's not a problem with gene therapy at all. The chemotherapy, um, unfortunately, uh, can predispose in the long term to certain types of cancers. Um, and this is because um, the um, exposure to chemotherapy is sort of like getting exposed to a lot of x-rays or other toxic things or even the sun. Um, and so uh, that has effects on the body. Um, and so 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later, people can develop cancers um, and they can be either blood cancers or of different parts of the body. And this can be equally true for transplant or gene therapy because both of those usually involve at least some um, chemotherapy. Whereas cancers caused by the vector um, that I told you about only occur in gene therapy where you're using a viral vector, but I will emphasize that so far, those have only been seen with the old fashioned vectors that we no longer use. So in conclusion, a tremendous amount of progress has been made in both transplantation and gene therapy. For now, transplantation remains the standard treatment for many primary immune deficiencies, and some patients have both options available. Because these diseases are rare, it is really important to seek out doctors with experience and expertise, and you might want to get more than one opinion in order to have the full picture. And with that, I will end, and I'm happy to take questions during the question answer period. All right, before we begin the Q&A, please remember that each individual's treatment and condition is unique. The information presented during the session is not medical advice, and nor is it intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. 
please always seek the advice of a physician or other qualified health provider with questions concerning a medical condition. At this time, please join me in thanking Dr. Sung Young Pai from the National Cancer Institute and National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at NIH for that wonderful presentation, and welcome to the Q&A portion of this session. We've received some really great questions for Dr. Pai, so we will jump right in and get started. Dr. Pai, why would you choose gene therapy over HSCT or bone marrow transplant? Well, first, I want to thank the IDF organizers for um, inviting me to give this session. Um, it's obviously uh, something that I care a lot about and, and spend a great deal of time trying to improve um, for the community. And so I, I welcome the opportunity to um, uh, educate people and um, answer some questions. So with respect to how one would choose gene therapy over an allogeneic transplant or a transplant from a, a, a donor, um, I, I'm going to assume that the person asking the question is um, aware, you know, that it's not always possible. You know, it depends on um, whether you have both of those options available. And assuming you do, um, the, the choice um, has to do with the different risks involved. And some of the differences in the risks are intrinsic to the um, therapy and are sort of the same, no matter which disease you're talking about. And then um, some of those are dependent on the individual disease and how the gene therapy uh, is designed or how the gene therapy protocol is designed. So some of the generic differences um, that are important to understand is that anytime you do a transplant using a donor, you have the risk of having an immunological complication uh, because the cells are cells coming from another person. So there's both the chance that uh, the patient would reject the cells, um, the bone marrow cells, for example, and the opposite to occur, that the immune system coming from the donor um, could try to attack the patient. Uh, and that process is called graft versus host disease. So the advantage of gene therapy is that you are using cells from the person, so they are unlikely to reject them. And the other is that um, the immune system is, again, coming from, or the immune cells, if there are any contained within the graft, are coming from the person. So graft versus host disease is not possible. The other thing to recognize is that um, there are um, certain potential side effects of getting gene therapy that are restricted to gene therapy. This namely is this issue of, uh, in the case of viral vectors, for example, that the viral vector could um, inappropriately uh, turn on uh, genes um, that could lead to cancer. Uh, the note there is that um, this has so far only been seen in the older vectors. Um, and then finally, there are some side effects or issues that are shared in, in that most of the time uh, you have to undergo some type of chemotherapy treatment to clear out the bone marrow space so that either the cells from the donor or the gene therapy cells, you know, have a place to grow. Um, and so there are sort of some shared effects of the chemotherapy for either type of treatment. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Dr. Pai, lots to consider. Someone is wondering how they go about being evaluated for something like gene therapy. They have a teenage son with CVID who's been treated for four and a half years and has also just been diagnosed with stiff person syndrome. So the process of getting evaluated for gene therapy, um, first um, you have to be sure that you have a uh, defined genetic disorder. The next is to uh, seek out um, expertise in that genetic disorder um, because, you know, not all, uh, at the current time in the U.S. at least, uh, all gene therapy uh, treatments are uh, on a research basis. Um, so you need to identify an investigator who is interested and has developed a gene therapy protocol or treatment trial. Um, assuming that those two things are met, um, then, you know, it's a, it's a consultation, a clinical consultation similar to other uh, consultations for transplantation. Um, so I would encourage you to uh, search, for example, on 
clinicaltrials.gov um, and see if there is um, a gene therapy trial for the genetic disorder uh, that you have. Thanks, Dr. Pai. Are there any conditions that do better with gene therapy um, rather than some others that you would suggest pursue that treatment? Um, so because all of the gene therapy treatments for the most part are still on a research basis, um, any comparison that we make between standard transplantation versus gene therapy um, is a little difficult because the number of patients that have been treated with gene therapy is going to be smaller than the patients that have been a lot smaller than the patients that have been treated with transplant. Um, and, you know, strictly speaking, there have not been many studies that sort of head to head compare. Um, that said, I would say an example of a disease um, that appears to do better with gene therapy would be severe combined immunodeficiency due to adenosine deaminase deficiency, ADA SCID. Um, and I say that because um, the recent studies, including a very prominent one published in the New England Journal, um, has shown 100% basically survival and very high efficacy and because of the issues of the gene therapy not um, being associated in any way with graft versus host disease that a transplant could, you know, that's one where you could say gene therapy is a home run and that um, it's um, very clear that that disease um, does very, very well with gene therapy. Thanks, Dr. Pai. Someone is mentioning that they're not sure they understand the process uh, in gene therapy to make the normal copy of the gene before it's introduced to the vector in X-SCID, for example. How long of a process is it to make the normal copy, and is it something that happens right before introducing it into the vector? Yes. So this is a, a rather technical and sophisticated question. I happen to know the source, and I'm just going to let the source know that um, if I am not answering quite the right question, to feel free to reach out to me separately. Um, I think the way to answer this question is to explain a little bit of the technical details of creating the vector. So there are two parts to creating the vector when you're using a viral vector um, for gene therapy. One is making the piece of DNA that you uh, then use a cell line um, to um, uh, take that um, uh, genetic material and produce viral particles. Um, and the making of that um, genetic material, which we usually call a plasmid, um, is, is pretty easy. And that's the stage at which you decide, you know, how you're going to design the normal copy of the gene. And then it's really just like cutting and pasting by sort of standard molecular biology techniques to make the vector or to make the plasmid. You use that plasmid um, to generate viral particles that then you test, you know, in all the animal systems and the cell systems and everything to show that this is good enough to go forward with a clinical trial. The second part is the making of viral particles, um, but specifically viral particles that are good enough to use with human cells and like actually you know, do the gene therapy in people. Um, so by that time, you've already figured out what to do you know, with the normal copy of the gene, and that's um, sort of a different part of the process. Thank you, Dr. Pai. About how long would a patient with PI need to be in the hospital before, during, and after a bone marrow transplant? How long do they have to remain in quarantine after they are released? Yes. So um, I think um, this is best answered um, by reviewing briefly what um, uh, the timeline is, that there's sort of four phases. The first phase is getting worked up for transplants and determining you know, who your donor would be and all that kind of stuff. That's outpatient. 
The, pain, the part that's in the hospital is the second part, which typically is about six to eight weeks. Um, and um, that's the true sort of inpatient stay. Um, and you know, most of the pre-bone marrow transplant workup doesn't entail being in the hospital and can be done in an outpatient basis. Once you're discharged, then um, the follow-up um, that's outpatient um, is also in sort of an early time period and then the later time period. The early time period is the first couple of months after discharge until the patient is about 100 days post day zero, post the day that they received the transplanted cell. Um, and that is usually a little bit more intense in follow-up, and the patient is definitely in very strict isolation for those first 100 days. Between day 100 and one year, the patient usually remains in isolation, meaning that they um, are excluded from going to school, are supposed to avoid crowded places, are supposed to basically be in their home or outside in the open air, distanced from people or um, in the clinic. You know. And then the time between 100 days and one year that you're sort of released from that quarantine depends a lot on the individual doctor, the individual institutional guidelines, and then your individual situation in terms of how long you're on immunosuppressive medications, how well the immune system is recovering, et cetera. Thanks, Dr. Pai. Can you speak to the long-term monitoring of those treated with either a bone marrow transplant or gene therapy? I know that bone marrow transplants can be repeated in the future if necessary, but can gene therapy treatments be repeated as well if needed? So those are kind of two different questions. Um, so the uh, maybe I'll ask, answer the second one first in that, yes, gene therapy can be repeated. Um, uh, and it has been, you know, in some trials. Um, the second and the other part, the first part of the question in terms of the follow-up, um, so for an allogeneic transplant or for a transplant from a donor, um, the follow-up is usually very intense in the first year. Then in the next few years, you know, it'll space out to every three months or every six months. And then by the time the person is two or three years out from the transplant, we usually recommend a yearly follow-up. Um, now, not all people are able to do that. And depending on how far away they live from the transplant center, um, I'm sad to say that not all insurances um, approve. Um, but I think that it is important um, in order to monitor that the uh, transplant is still working, and then more importantly, to monitor for side effects usually related to the chemotherapy that was received. For gene therapy, um, again, this is still a research um, treatment, and the Food and Drug Administration requires that patients are followed in some way um, for 15 years after receiving gene therapy of the kind that uses stem cells with integrating um, viral vectors. Now, all of that follow-up does not have to be in person. Um, usually what happens is you're on a gene therapy protocol for some number of years. Typically these days it's two years. And then after two years, um, up until 15 years, the gene therapy um, investigators are required to basically keep tabs on the patient um, to get at least annual medical records to review, um, get um, either every six month or every year blood work um, to monitor whether the gene is still there, things like that. Thank you. Uh, is gene therapy likely an effective treatment for PI patients who may also have mastocytosis? You know, to be honest with you, I don't know enough about mastocytosis and its genetic underpinnings to be able to answer that question. Thanks, Dr. Pai. Would you say that the outcomes of gene therapy vary with the age of the person receiving the treatment? Yeah, that's a good question. I think first, it's a little bit difficult to say just because gene therapy is so new and there are so many different diseases. Um, when it comes to um, a transplant from a donor, it's clear that there is a trend that younger is better. And in certain diseases such as severe combined immunodeficiency or SCID, it's very definitively shown that younger is better. 
um, to the degree that you know, treatment before your body gets too damaged, you know, from having disease for a long time is better in general. I would say that, you know, that's probably an argument for gene therapy to be done sooner um, rather than later um, in terms of age. On the other hand, um, you know, the eligibility criteria may vary. Um, and, you know, in general, we try when the situation is appropriate um, to give experimental therapies to older individuals first, namely adults rather than kids, um, because the adult is more uh, directly able to give consent for research treatment. Um, and uh, the same as you go down, you know, for children who are capable of giving assent. But it also has to take the individual disease into account. Thank you, Dr. Pai. So we have just about four minutes left, and I'm only seeing one more question. So if you have any questions, please submit them into the Q&A box, and we'll try to get to them with the time we have remaining. Uh, so the last question I have for now is, are there any current clinical trials using the new gene editing technology for any of the types of PI? Yes. Unless I'm mistaken, I believe that there are a number of trials in development but I don't believe any are open for prime time yet. Um, I think, no, I'm mixing up with a different talk. Um, I, I, uh, I do know that there are um, promising preclinical data um, for gene editing, for example, in wiscott Aldrich syndrome, in X-linked SCID, in CD40 ligand, in other words, X-linked hyper IgM. Um, uh, and there are various other diseases that are being approached um, in, at an earlier stage, you know, that where scientifically it's at an earlier stage than that. Oh, another one is uh, autosomal recessive um, CGD, um, chronic granulomatous disease um, due to mutations in the P47 gene. So there are a number on the horizon, but I don't think any active trials yet, unless I'm mistaken. Thanks, Dr. Pai. So maybe at the next PI conference, we'll have more of an update and maybe more diagnoses ready for a gene therapy prime time. Yes. All right, that is all of the questions that I see coming in through the Q&A box. Uh, we also just have a few minutes left. So if there are no other questions from those in the audience, uh, we can wrap things up. Um, so I just want to take a moment to say thank you so much, Dr. Pai. It has really been an honor to have you join us today and share your wealth of knowledge for gene therapy and bone marrow transplants, bone marrow transplants for types of PI. Um, thank you again, and I wish to everybody in the audience to have a great rest of the conference. There are plenty of educational sessions happening uh, this afternoon and into tomorrow. So we hope to see you uh, again on the virtual platform. Uh, have a great rest of your day and take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.